Welcome back to RFL. I'm Andrew Whitman in tonight for Richard French. We continue our interview now with Republican Congresswoman Nan Hayworth of New York Hudson Valley, who's going to be running in the 18th district uh, this November. This is the first time I've had a chance to talk to you since the selection of Paul Ryan as the vice presidential nominee for your party. Uh, you serve in the House with Paul Ryan. Tell us uh, a little bit about him in you know 30 seconds if you can. A man of principle, a man of honor. He uh, is uh, courageous about uh, bringing forth a plan that he uh, really feels will serve the needs of our uh, economy and of our crucial programs, Medicare and Social Security, uh, and of future generations who are going to need jobs and opportunity and also will want to rely on those same programs. A lot of focus on, on reducing the deficit in his plans, and as you mentioned, a lot of focus on Medicare. That's been getting a lot of attention the last couple of days, and, and uh, certainly there are uh, uh, there's a healthy debate going on about the plan and the future of Medicare. Uh, critics look at some of the specifics that have been proposed by Congressman Ryan that say it could lead to cost spikes, could cut doctors and hospitals, could cut nursing homes, could lead to uh, a, a two-tiered system so that healthier and wealthier patients are in private plans or unhealthy or poorer patients are in public plans. However, the, uh, the argument in favor, or one of the biggest arguments in favor of Paul Ryan's plan, is that you know, it, the program could be unable to cover all seniors by as early as 2016, as late as 2024. It depends on Absolutely. who you talk to at any one time. Right, right. Um, you're, con you're convinced that the Medicare voucher plan that he is presenting will still provide ample coverage for all seniors down the road even yeah. low-income seniors. Well, yeah, absolutely, Andrew, and it's very important, and, and let's resolve right here on RNN, uh, on Richard French Live with you to get this right. It's not a voucher program. It's premium support, and there is a material difference. With a voucher program, you're getting a check, uh, which you uh, deploy mm -hmm. uh, electively, let's say. Um, and certainly vouchers are proposed for various things, including school choice, and they, they, they may very well have a role there. But what we're talking about for Medicare is premium support. And the material difference is that with premium support, Medicare's paying uh, the premium. Seniors choose from an array of programs. All of them will be covered. And the idea, the word voucher says, gosh, you know, some people might not be able to afford coverage. Everybody will get coverage, uh, irrespective of their ability to pay. Will they be able to get the coverage they want? They will be able, then the idea is that they will be able to get the coverage that they want, the coverage that they prefer. There will be, a, the, this is the Wyden Ryan plan that was incorporated into the 2012 Path to Prosperity budget. It's a very responsible, compassionate budget. Uh, and what it says is that region by region, there'll be an auction process uh, among insurers who will offer their plans, a so called reverse auction. The second uh, least expensive plan that meets the criteria that Medicare sets will be the basic plan, if you will, and premium support will be provided uh, for every senior who chooses that plan. And by the way, this would be for seniors who are, uh, well, for anybody who's under 55 right, right now. Right. Uh, current seniors and those 55 and over, uh, all of them would be able to have traditional Medicare or have the option of this premium support idea. But, but there's been a lot written and a lot of criticism about this plan in that there may be a number of seniors who want a, le a coverage level that's higher than uh, than the reimbursement would, would entitle them to, or, or, you know, things may come up that may drive that, that price higher and they would have to pay out of pocket. Mm -hmm. are, are those criticisms unfounded, or is there some validity to them? Well, not, not, not to the idea that people won't get the coverage they need. The idea is that no one will have to go into uh, financial uh, harm because of the insurance plan that they need. There, there are, will definitely be allowances for uh, seniors who have uh, more serious uh, medical conditions that require greater help. You know, the idea is to provide the appropriate level of support for everybody who's relying on Medicare, but to do it in a way that allows consumer choice uh, to draw and competition among insurers region by region, allowing for, for local uh, differences in the way we provide care and the way we prefer to have care and in the prevailing economic conditions within a region. But we use that choice and that competition to help us to afford uh, to continue to provide Medicare benefits to everybody who relies on them. Because right now the alternative plan is, number one, for Medicare, uh, for the trust fund to run out, and then there's nothing and, and no alternatives have been proposed. 
Uh, so, it, the, you know, current law says Medicare is going to run out and we don't have anything to offer. And that will be an immediate and severe blow to seniors. And also to have the Independent Payment Advisory Board, which is going to determine reimbursements and immediately limit access to care. I want to switch to the topic that you and I have probably spent more time talking about in all the times that I've interviewed jobs. Yeah. Um, you're, you're coming towards the end of your first term in office, two years. Uh, name for me three votes that you've taken that have helped create jobs. Well, absolutely. Well, for one thing, I've voted for the Jobs Act, uh, which did pass in March, passed the House and the Senate, was signed into law by the President, which was an immediate way to provide a boost to emerging companies uh, who want to uh, find investors and to grow. And it allows an easier path for them to do that from the standpoint of uh, the many regulatory burdens that, that stand in the way right now. Uh, and we're already seeing uh, an increase in uh, the number of companies that have decided they can uh, go public and grow and attract investment. That's so that's one. one. Two, I have voted f for two bills to extend uh, the 01 and 03 uh, tax structures for at least another year and then to reform the tax code, which uh, is widely agreed uh, that you know it's, it's burdensome, it's overly complex, it's overly costly, and it is driving jobs out of the United States. It's driving enterprise out of the United States. So that's, that's a second effect. That's two votes that, that I've taken. So uh, that's another pair. And the third one is that I voted, and there are more, but I voted to repeal and replace the uh, 2010 health law, which relates, of course, to, to Medicare as well. That's $710 billion, uh, more than that estimated out of Medicare. But in addition, it is an impediment to hiring today because employers, and they will tell you, they don't know what's coming up in terms of increased costs except that they are going to be hit with mandates, penalties, and increased taxes, and that and, makes and them I, not want to grow. And, and, I, and I, I understand that point, but we've talked many times about, uh, about creating jobs and about President Obama's uh, job record or jobs record. I want to show you a couple of things. One uh, is that uh, jobs gained and lost. Those on the left-hand side of the screen, the numbers that, uh, of job losses under the uh, end of President Bush's administration, and there you see positive job growth. This is starting in 2008. That's correct. Yep. But then you get mm -hmm. positive job growth starting uh, with uh, in March of 2010. And but going if you forward, look, look at the net and loss, under, Andrew, no, I look understand. at the I understand, but area under the curve uh, or you know, over the curve and under the but curve. But I think you can make a valid argument that the graph, uh, the left-hand portion of the graph, a lot of that is the hangover from the recession that hit in 2008 as the economy cratered out. Now you're, uh, you're. But if you look, we haven't. We haven't even. We've still a net loss of about no, four point two million particularly... jobs, Andrew. We have more people unemployed, uh, and at the poverty level than ever in decades in this country. Nobody is satisfied with the speed of the recovery. No. Nobody is. But there is a recovery that is underway, at least when it comes to jobs. The the second qu part of this question has to do with corporate exactly. profits, because you're talking about repealing and replacing Obamacare. Uh, you've talked a lot about. Which I never uh, refer to as Obamacare. Uh, you know that. Fair enough. Uh, you, you've also, and your party has talked a lot about uh, trying to make the uh, business environment better and re eliminating regulations and that sort of thing. These are corporate profits in the United States. They're at an all-time record high. If they're at an all-time, if, if they're you at, see if, from where they started, if they're six, but it, but they're at an all-time record high right now. So companies are making bigger profits than they've ever made before. You, you and your party are arguing that if we only make their profits bigger they'll be able to invest and they'll be able to hire more people. Why is that a valid argument if they're already not hiring the people that we'd like them to well, hire while not, making record profits? Well, Andrew, that's actually not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that we need to make the environment in the United States friendly to hiring and growth. So that's the argument, is that this has become, this country, for reasons that we can fix, this country has become a place that is not conducive to investment in additional facilities for manufacturers, let's say. It's not conducive to hiring in a number of regions in the country, some more than others, because we have the highest corporate tax rates in the world, we have the, the highest rates on individual and small businesses in the world, and they're, they're going to get higher if we don't act now. But if companies are already, if corporate profits are already at a record high, how does increasing corporate profits even further and making an even this more business-friendly environment I inspire them to do something that they're not doing now while they're making record profits? Andrew, this is about, again, this is about making sure that this country is a sensible place for any business, small or large, and two-thirds of jobs are created by small businesses, for any business, small or large, to actually continue to grow. 
And we have a climate that between regulations that exist on the books now and those that are rapidly uh, being written and added to thousands of pages of new regulations uh, between the 2010 health law and the 2010 Dodd-Frank law, uh, we are creating a situation which is true. A lot of uh, corporate investment is sitting on the sidelines. And they're, they're looking toward the future. They're looking toward 2013 and seeing that tax cliff coming and seeing a raft of new taxes associated with implementing the 2010 health law and saying, we're not doing anything right now because it, it, it's, it's going to be more costly uh, to grow here and to hire here than in other places uh, in, in, in the world. And we have to think about our customers. We have to think about how we can afford to compete in a global economy. Uh, and that's a very different situation than we faced uh, right after World War II, which is what most people's frame of reference is. It's an interesting debate. It's an interesting uh, d difference in perspectives. Our conversation with Congresswoman Nan Hayworth will continue in just a moment. We're going to talk Obamacare, or I'm sorry, health care reform, because you don't refer to it as Obamacare. That's next. Stay with us.